Welcome to Hotel Bar Sessions, Episode 1. Today's topic, freedom. Okay, hey listeners, this is Lee Johnson. I'm here with Ammon. Say hey, Ammon. Hey, Lee. How you doing? Hey, and I'm also here with Shannon. Say hey, Shannon. Hey, Lee. Hey, Ammon. How's it going? So the idea behind this podcast is that we all agree that the most interesting conversations that we have are when we go to conferences and we actually leave the sessions at the end of the day, we all meet up at the hotel bar to chat. So that's basically the premise of this podcast. Now, we don't want to go through a whole scripted scene where we pretend like we're sitting at a bar and we're ordering drinks. So just assume that we're all sitting here at a hotel bar, at a conference, just shooting the shit. That's what we do, right, guys? That's absolutely that's right. What, yeah, so yes. I've got my wine here, you've got your fireball, and we're set to go. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, ooh, busted. Okay, so <laughs> in, in future podcasts, we might actually be talking about an article or a book or some piece of media and pretend like we just came out of a session on that. But for these first few podcasts, we just wanted to give each of us a chance to tell our listeners a little bit about ourselves and then feature each of the hosts in something that they know. So Shannon is first up on the chopping block today. She's going to talk about something that is in her wheelhouse. So Shannon, what do you want to talk about? You know what I want to talk about? I'm going to tell you what I want to talk about. I want to talk <laughs> about freedom. And not in the flag waving kind of way, although, you know, whatever, you're going to take it that way, take it that way. But I want to talk about freedom in philosophy as a philosophical idea, because I think it gets unfairly panned and unfairly rejected. By who? Well, yes. I'm not going to I'm not going to name any names, but I'm going to say that whenever I give a talk names, but I'm going to say that whenever I give a talk on freedom, I'm always worried that the Foucauldians and the Deleuzians are going to come out of the shadows and say, yeah, but to anything that I say. <laughs> I have Just a question. Put, it's more in the form of a comment. But. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, some of my best friends are Foucauldians. <laughs> but they they generally don't really want to talk about freedom. And I get yeah. it because people are rightly worried about power and systemic oppression and ways in which subjects are produced rather than actually having any kind of free agency in their own production. And I understand that. And I think it's completely legitimate. And I think that there are ways to incorporate that into a conversation about freedom. But sometimes I just want to talk about freedom, you know? Can you give us an, like, an example? Because I think freedom can mean so many things, and I really want us cool. nice. Yeah. Amy yeah, just teed that right up for you, didn't he? <laughs> and I'm just going to walk right through. <laughs> so I am completely fascinated in the early conceptions of French existential freedom. So the existentialists have these wild notions of freedom, and I think there are just all sorts of problems with them. But I do think that they get to the heart of what it is that I think we should preserve when we talk about freedom philosophically. So I'll give you an example since you asked, Ammon. Mm -hmm. In The Transcendence of the Ego, which is an early essay by Jean-Paul Sartre, and I love teaching it because I just think it's just sexy as all get out. He gives these conclusions and he sort of buries the lead. And in these conclusions, he gives this example of a young bride as described by Genet. And this young bride is overcome with terror, that she's terror, that she's going to solicit passersby as a prostitute. Now, as Sartre acknowledges, there's nothing in her background, there's nothing in her upbringing, there's nothing even in what she thinks of as her desires that would in any way have her do this, but she's terrified of it anyway. And Sartre says what she's terrified of is this vertiginous, monstrous freedom, this freedom that overflows and cannot be contained by the ego, cannot be contained by the I. And that's cool. I like that idea because it's there all the time. And when you teach this kind of stuff, students get really into it. So yeah. that's an example that I would say captures what I think is interesting and worth even preserving in this idea of freedom, dare I say radical freedom. Can I ask you something? So I've always wondered, but never bothered to actually look up. So, cause I also <laughs> love teaching that section. And I think, you know, I, I totally agree. I think that students love or love to hate radical freedom, right? right? 
I, I sometimes, when I teach transcendence of the ego, I try to dial down some, but but that maybe that's wrong of me, so you can persuade me that I'm wrong to do that. <laughs> Although, and I totally agree, it's all over there. But okay, so here's my question. You mentioned that this example comes from Janae. I don't know the Janae story. I know the movie Belle de Jour. Do, do you guys know this movie? No? I don't know this Idea. Movie, no. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to have a watching party. <laughs> You you've got to okay. If you love this example, you've got to watch this movie. It, it is the story of the young bride, oh. starring a like nineteen or twenty year old Catherine Deneuve. Oh. That is not why I watched it, of course. Of course not. <laughs> to be fair, when I was nineteen or twenty, right? So, it's, so yeah, I mean that's the story, right? Is that she? Maybe we can't talk about this too much, and if I'm the only one who's seen it, but well, I do highly recommend that you guys go watch it and we'll have a watch party late party. Well, finish- later. I recommend that you guys go watch it and we'll have a watch party late party. Well, later. finish your finish your thoughts at least. I mean, so she very much in the context of the movie, it has a lot to do. It seems to me with her relationship to her husband. Her husband is like a bourgeois doctor, and also her fascination with the possibilities of her own sexuality, which she doesn't feel like she has control over. So it seems to me like her perception in the movie is the opposite of radical freedom, right? That she feels called into this activity that although there's no constraint to do it, there she feels a compulsion that she can't fully explain. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, you can argue is the flip side of radical freedom, right? It's like, well, why am I? And I think that, you know, you could even argue that shows up in the way that Sartre talks about it because there is a sense of like, well, once I realize I could do this thing, I become attracted to it. But I guess I've just always felt like in this particular example – that compulsion, although she can't explain it, and although it's not rational, and so it might not fit into rational conceptions of freedom, it doesn't end up feeling like she's rational, and so it might not fit into rational conceptions of freedom. It doesn't end up feeling like she's a particularly free character to me. Right. Um, well, I mean, I'm not going to say that I know exactly how you are thinking about freedom, but I think that whenever we talk about radical freedom... It always sort of sounds like, and we tend to think of it as this ability to choose absolutely any possible thing that we want to do, or even at like, not without it sounding preposterous. Like we might say, okay, I know I can't choose to be in Detroit right now. And I know I can't choose to grow wings and fine. But I think we just sort of think that, well, we actually have this complete and total control to choose within our sphere infinite possible things. And while I do think there's a sort of sense of infinity working in radical freedom, I really think that what it's about is just that there is no absolute containment of our identities and of our egos, and that there's nothing that's fixed and determined in what and who we are. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Sartre actually says this at one point. I think it's in Existentialism is a Humanism, where he says, you know, when I say absolute freedom, I don't mean freedom with no restrictions or the freedom to do whatever you want. When I say that a man is absolutely free, what I'm saying is that there's no time at which he is absolutely unfree. That's so right. there's always some freedom there. Right. Right. And I usually teach stuff from being in nothingness or from existentialism is a humanism. But I always use as an example of that kind of vertiginous, overwhelming sense of your own freedom that you were just mentioning, that feeling of vertigo, that sort of uneasiness. It's not a fear of falling. It's a fear of jumping that, you know, when you step to the edge of a building, edge of a building or whatever, that uneasiness that you're feeling is this subconscious realization that there's nothing standing between you and the end of your existence, except for your own decision not to just take one more step off the building, right? That's right. And you can find a million examples of that. How many times have you been sitting in a quiet room and thought, there's literally nothing stopping me from just getting up and taking my clothes off or screaming fire or, you know, whatever. I always give like, the drop the baby example. You know, you're holding the cute <laughs> baby and you're yeah, like, right, I, could, <laughs> I could just drop this baby. And you're like, I would never, there's nothing in my past, nothing oh my in my character that would drop this baby. But you're like, but I could drop this baby. I always give the example of driving down the highway where you're like, I could totally just swerve into oncoming traffic. You and know? they totally resonate with that yeah, because we've and, all felt it. Yeah, because we've and, all felt it. We've yeah, all and, had and, those moments where we feel that our egos and our identities are not determinate of all of our actions. 
and that we could do something other than what we assume we were going to do. Okay, so that is what I have a question about, because this is something that I struggle with just in my own mind, is whether or not that is a description of something real, right? Like that is a description of something that is really true, that we really are free, or whether that is a description of how we experience human existence. Is it the case that that experience of not being entirely determined is a kind of epiphenomenon of human consciousness? Or is it the case that we're really free? And I think that as I've gotten older, I feel like I just don't care. They like, d- I don't care. I don't <laughs> that's care. what I, I don't care. I don't that's care. what I was going to say. What does it matter? That is does my it matter? experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if, it we, is- if we experience ourselves and existence as having these potentials, that are uncapturable until they're put into action, what does it matter if that is an ontological radical freedom or it's simply what it means to be human? Because for me, I guess I sort of don't see that being a a hard division. Do you see this as being of a type with, are we living in a simulation or not? Like, you know, is the world outside of my mind actually there or is it not? Which I also think to a certain extent in my actual practical existence, I don't care. Like it is the case that I think it's real and I'm operating as if it's real. But, you know, when I put on my philosopher pants, you know, which are good looking pants, let me tell you. I bet they are. I've seen those philosopher (laughs) philosopher pants and they are gorgeous. When I put on my philosopher pants, it does matter if it's all a simulation or not, or if I'm entirely determined or not. And I think this is indicative of exactly the sort of angst that Sartre and many other existentialist philosophers articulate that sort of comes along with this experience of freedom. But those are the questions that I get right up to the door and I'm like, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming back to you later. Right? <laughs> well, I think it's impossible to prove one way or the other. And so I just right. think it's it's in the end, it's uninteresting for me to put all my chips on the side of it's absolutely an ontological reality rather than just this, as you said, sort of an epiphenomenon of consciousness or an epiphenomenon of human existence, because I, it, it does matter to us that that's how it feels and that it speaks to us on our sort of deepest level do in fact feel these possibilities and these potentialities. And so, yeah, I guess I'm more concerned if we're living in a simulation just because that freaks me out, (laughs) but I'm not as concerned about whether I have to actually prove that we are free. I'm kind of playing on uh, Ammon's heart here. I'm going to tug a little at Ammon's heartstrings here. But I mean, Derry Dot once said this thing about democracy where he's like, you know, democracy is just the best word I have right now. It it might be another word someday. And I sometimes think that way about freedom. Like, you know, it's consonant with my experience. It's very useful for me. It kind of coheres with the sort of philosophical universe of ideas that I want to hold as coherent. But it is still the case that in the last 60 years, we know more about social forces and implicit biases and all of these things. But it's still the case that it remains useful for me to think of human beings as free. I sometimes think about it like Derrida talked about democracy. It's like, yeah, freedom. Okay, that's the word I've got right now. Maybe I'm not committed to it forever. I don't know it for a fact to be true. Right. But I mean, would you say that or are you more committed to it than that? I think I'm going to be a little bit more committed to that because I think that we have this illusion that we are getting closer to objective truth in some way that is going to explain human beings and the world. And I think that we just have different, sometimes more elaborate, sometimes more effective ways of explaining human existence and human being and the world. But I don't know that I would even say that that really touches on the notion of freedom that I'm talking about here. I would say for the freedom that I'm talking about here, I would say, for example, to what you just said, look, whether it, we call it facticity in Sartre, the facts of our existence, or we call it the situation in Beauvoir, right? The situation that informs our experience. All of those things are just the grounds of action. 
So if I were to say that I have genetic predispositions, absolutely, we all do. If I were to say that there are certain socioeconomic factors that form who and what I am as a person in a particular time and place, absolutely. These things are all just the facts of our existence. And no matter how far down you go, I still think that you can make the claim that those are the grounds of action. It's not that we're getting closer to limiting the sphere of freedom so that it's really, really small. We're just altering what the grounds of action are by new forms of knowledge about the facts of our existence. You mean limiting the domain of pain of free action? Because it could all be entirely determined and it would still be the grounds of action. Right? I mean, it would still be the action. situation yeah. in which actions take place. Right. They just I would, would not yeah. be free actions. Yeah. I'm doubling down with free action. It sounds to me like, if I'm understanding correctly, Shannon, you're defending this notion that the notion of freedom is irreducible to the phenomenon of our consciousness, if I'm yes. understanding you correctly. So that, yeah, that would be a stronger position, it seems like. I mean, um, I certainly would say it is irreducible to our ego mm -hmm. or our identity. Consciousness, right? That's always a really tricky sort of thing because consciousness is the activity, right? That's right, part that's of the right. actual activity rather than this object, thing, essence, self that we identify with. Mm -hmm. But I mean, not to be the comment bro here or the. <laughs> <laughs> please, but please like, be the comment but, bro. Not be a specific ilk of comment bro. I'm going to be the Kantian comment bro. But I mean, it's all going to be, you know in the context of how consciousness experiences the world, right? It's not as if you can know that we are free outside the experience of our own consciousness. That is Absolutely. objectively the case, right? I think that in practical terms, in moral terms, political terms, I 100% agree with you. But in philosophical terms, I can't, like, how do, how do you kind of double down on that bet, right? Like, how do you double down on any bet that says independent of consciousness X as a consciousness? Like, how I, do don't, you, I don't you think, know? well, I don't think I'm making, no, I, I don't want to be making a claim that independent of how humans experience the world, there is freedom. I don't even, I wouldn't even be able to make that kind of a claim. Right. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. You're, yeah, yeah. you're saying that I, you're, you're saying that identity and ego are functions of consciousness. Yes. But, other products of consciousness by acts of consciousness right and and that is i mean this is one thing that i've always wondered about in sartre and de beauvoir's account and especially like to go back to transcendence of the ego where sartre is hanging so much i would say maybe even more than freedom on the word spontaneity yeah and i've always struggled with identifying whether or not spontaneity counts as a phenomenon consonant with the idea of a free will which it sounds like we're all at the very least skeptical about okay. or or whether it's a completely different way of situating freedom, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that the problem, right? I mean, I love the early Sartre because he's intoxicating and he makes you fall in love with philosophy. At least that's the effect he had on me. And I certainly know that he has the effect on a lot of the students that I teach. And so I love that about him. Mm -hmm. But there are deep limitations to what he's doing here. And I think spontaneity is such a an important box that, well, he talks about it in terms of its creation ex nihilo. And I love that idea, but it produces this sense that there is no temporal linkage of our experience. Huh. That's funny. I actually prefer, I'm totally sold on spontaneity. I'm less sold on freedom. So, but, but, but it might be he, sort of what we're taking. Saying, I yeah. think he's sort of saying that that's what radical freedom right. is, is that spontaneity of consciousness. Yeah, I guess. Okay, but I, have, so, I have a dumb question. Ahead, yeah. So like, I think I might be losing the thread here. So to me, using freedom and spontaneity, like I don't see them operating in the same way as ideas. So Eamon just said, I'm more committed to spontaneity than I am to freedom. But what do you mean by spontaneity if it's not freedom exercising itself without programs, in a, without programs, in a non-programmatic way? Actually, I think I do want to say that. I'm always concerned with the way that Sartre talks about spontaneity as a kind of creation ex nihilo. Mm -hmm. 
And that while I love the sort of non-determinist aspect of freedom and spontaneity, I don't like the idea as if there's this creation of the human at every single moment that is untethered to the temporal mm. flow of the human and untethered to the situation of the human. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, but I was not actually picking a bow with you. I was picking a bow with Ammon. Oh, so then when, I'm so much Ammon happier. Said, <laughs> okay, oh, so when, please pick the bone with Ammon. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when, so Ammon said, I'm more committed to spontaneity than to freedom. And what I'm right. saying is, is that I don't understand in that claim how those two terms are parallel rather than interdependent on. You know yeah, what I'm and saying? I, and I, I would parallel, rather than interdependent on. You know yeah, I, and I, I would have to work this out thematically. So let me try this. And and again, like I, if this works, it works. And if not, you, then I'll stand corrected. But um, but it seems to me like I love Sartre, I love De Beauvoir, but I, I will admit, Shannon, back to where we started. Like, there's this inner Deleuze Foucault comment. I knew it. You're always in say. the shadows. Yeah, people but, are always lurking. <laughs> but part of but but part of the reason why is because I I am unpersuaded that Sartre and de Beauvoir don't actually believe in the free will and that they're not mm -hmm. sneaking it in. And so when I hear the word freedom and when I see their accounts of freedom, it's really hard for me to untether it from that. Whereas if you just say to me something like, look, we don't understand, it's going to be hard to do this without some sort, of, some sort of like biological determinism. And that's not what I mean, but just for convenience, let me run with this. We don't understand all the ways in which what we call the self or how we experience ourselves is tethered to or tied to broader material or social phenomena. But whatever it is that we experience as a self, we experience as radically spontaneous, as constantly emerging, sort of weightless in a Kundaran sense, right? And so phenomenologically, I'm quite persuaded by that, but I don't necessarily see that as entailing, you know, back to the Derrida point, you could use the word freedom, but I'm not sure of any reason to other than unless I was committed to a notion of a free will. Does okay, that help so, answer that? Yeah, clear? it did help answer the question. But now I think I just really deeply disagree with you. Like my experience of myself as free is not an experience of radical spontaneity. It, it's only in the moments that I'm standing at the edge of the ledge that I experience myself as a freedom that is consonant with radical spontaneity. That is, I know that, I know that Shannon just disavowed this definition, but as a kind of ex nihilo creation, but my everyday experience of myself is as situated and constrained and somewhat determined. And it's only in exceptional circumstances that I exercise this kind of spontaneity. So now it's even more interesting <laughs> and troublesome to me that you're more committed to spontaneity in that sense than... Uh, yeah, well, but I, I, good, I, yeah. So, I mean, I am always perplexed by this and trying to answer this question myself. And so I don't pretend to actually have decided this, but I'm with you. That kind of eruption of the pure possibility of freedom happens only in moments. There's only a moment where I'm actually like, whoa, I really could throw my shoe at the professor while she's talking, or I really could drop the baby or swerve into oncoming traffic. It's always like these really fat. It's never like I could spontaneously throw a birthday party for my office staff. It's always like some dark <laughs> thing that you would do. When Shannon, we know, we know you, get, you hate babies. Let's just, you know I do. It's so true. I mean, Ammon and I, on the other hand, and Rick Lee, our friend. We, we love all love babies. You all love babies. I know. I know. Right. But I also really want to hold on to that those moments are possible because it's always there. It's just not always erupting. It's always possible that it can erupt. Right. But, you know, we would be probably pretty freaked out if it was a constant state of being. So I think, yeah, we experience the world as, I would still not use the word determined, but as situated and as exerting various degrees of pressure and force and abilities and impossibilities on us, but it's at any moment, right? At any moment. Yeah, I mean, I do 100% agree with Sartre about this, which is that absolute freedom 
does not make any sense, even as a concept. It has right. to be against something. It has to be in a situation. It has to be right. in a That's situation right. with some constraints. And so I guess maybe, Amen, what, what you're describing sounds mm-hmm. like something like absolute freedom without constraints. And you're saying that is the experience of the self. And I'm saying that is not my experience. Oh, no. Yeah. So that's that's not what I mean. So if I'm saying that, I want to revise it. No. And, and I agree with you guys that like whatever it is that we're describing, whether we want to call it freedom or spontaneity is not necessarily when I say that it's it's sort of the phenomenological basis. I don't necessarily mean that it's sort of. I hate to use a Heideggerian word here, but ontically always at the forefront of consciousness. In fact, I think that's far. You from don't the case. hate using a Heideggerian word. You love it. You were just I actually for that moment. I actually, so I, I do hate it. I'm forced to use them, right? Ontically, I'm in complete agreement with you guys. But the point is, it seems to me, and I think this is what like a lot of the literature that Sartre and Heidegger and De Beauvoir were reading. You know, Wolf, Joyce, etc. I don't think Heidegger ever read Wolf or Joyce, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, he just told people he did. He just told people he did. <laughs> <laughs> he absolutely read all of Proust. But the point is that that's latent in there, right? And so the phenomenology is trying to look at this meaning-making activity, which, yeah, most of the time we're not paying attention to, but it's there. I think that that is what's the experience of spontaneity. But, no, I don't think it's ever ex nihilo or, or against nothing. I think I would describe it be- precisely because we're talking about the way in which the self experiences itself as being in a world, which I recognize is another Heidegger term, but germane here, hopefully. What spontaneity is, is something like the surface of that phenomenon, which can sort of alter itself radically at any moment. But you're, you're talking about some sort of, um, I don't know, I mean, some yeah, sort of epiphenomenon. I, I don't understand why we can't the descriptor for spontaneous. Like, it seems to me just that average everyday understanding of what spontaneous means is something that's not determined, not programmatic, not determined in advance. And you're telling me that is your experience of yourself is spontaneous I, in that sense. That, no, that the experience of the way in which the self encounters the world is meaningful. That meaning that is, is your constant- experience of, of yourself is that at every moment you are encountering the world in a totally non-determined, non-programmatic, non-situated, like eruption. Because what what the yeah hell that would sound you're right like, that how, would do you, sound how, do you, how are how are you not what? a madman no but that's <laughs> wait that's, hold on you would correction be. <laughs> I right this is this is getting to the heart of it I think because I think we don't experience that because it would be yeah, yeah, impossible yeah. to comprehend but that's, hold on you would correction be. <laughs> I right this is this is getting to the heart of it I think because. I think we don't experience that because it would be yeah, yeah, impossible yeah. to comprehend, but it's latent. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I'm trying to say is like, I and mean, I think this is what Shannon and I both are trying to say, is that we very rarely experience that. That is those angsty moments where we confront the kind of radicalness of our freedom that Sartre describes as vertiginous, right? Like these are the moments at the the ledge, the moments when Shannon is about to drop the baby. These are those moments, but they are rare and they are illuminative, right? Of something that in order for us to function, we have to constantly regard in bad faith. You know, we have to- Yeah, you know, that's yeah. right. We're yeah. constantly no, I, pushing it aside and we're saying this idea that that we have an essence, that we have an identity, that we have an ego and it somehow determines our actions. It's a safety measure. It's a protective measure. We right? do it yeah. because we can't function in this vertiginous sense of freedom moment to moment to moment. It would be highly socially, politically, and personally problematic if we did. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with everything you guys were saying. So so anything that I said that sounded he's like, like I didn't. He's like, except. Than, <laughs> right, except. <laughs> except the word, except for, and, and it might just be quibbling over words, but I do kind of think the words matter here because they get at what the phenomenon is. Except for in those rare moments, I'm not sure that what we're experiencing is best described as freedom and i don't know what i'm saying is i don't know why to retain that word in those moments so take the example of in nausea of the doorknob yeah that's in nausea right before i go off on it i think so is there a doorknob in nausea does it get squishy yeah, I, remember, I think it's in, in nausea, and it might be in being a nothingness, but in one of those two books, in the Counts of Freedom. Wait, no, wait, let's, let's, yeah, let's, like, <laughs> let's not go. There's some, what, so. So 
So I, I believe we're going to say it's in nausea, and I'm now making this part of nausea whether or not it's there. <laughs> it's nausea part two. Yeah. <laughs> nausea the return. <laughs> <laughs> too much too much warm beer. So anyway, Rokantan is going up to a door, and he experiences, like, he can't open the door because the door gets squishy, and all the things, if, you read, if anyone has read nausea, there's all these long descriptions of the world and these very weird terms. But one of the points there, of course, is that, like, Sartre thinks, and, and Rokantan is experiencing, that what we're just describing as this sort of latent possibility is always there. And it's just, yeah, most of the time we're pushing it aside because otherwise we couldn't do things like open doorknobs. Right. But the moment when Rokantan isn't able to do it does not... It feels to me like this moment where he's realizing that his relationship to the world is radically altering itself at every moment as he's moving through it. And he's radically reproducing himself and his understanding of the world. And and so so suddenly that vertigo becomes a source of paralysis. Yeah. And it, it might just be quibbling over words, but it seems to me like the word spontaneity gets at that. Whereas I don't know that freedom does for me. And it might just be my hang up on the word. Uh, no, I actually, I really like that. And I think that the moments where it's not about all of the various things that I could do, but a sort of feeling of the removal of possibilities, right? You, you describe it as a kind of paralysis, just this almost, I can't act because it seems like the world has been denuded of possibilities. And that doesn't really seem to be captured by the word freedom. Even yeah. if it might reveal what freedom I feel, what freedom, I don't want to say structure, but the possibility of freedom. Yeah, I think that that last thing that Shannon said is actually, for me anyway, clearing up what is not really a disagreement between the three of us here. So I think that what Shannon and I originally said was there are these moments, these vertiginous moments, these moments of eruption where we realize that we're free that like that what we realize in those moments is that that we have this kind of consciousness as the experience of itself as being free i think what ammon is saying is that what we actually are experiencing in that moment is spontaneity and spontaneity can only happen in the context of a free being but that we're not experiencing freedom we're experiencing this eruption, this sort of yeah. unprogrammatic, yeah. undetermined moment, moment, and that's where all of the uneasiness comes from. I don't think that any of us are actually disagreeing here. I think that we're right. like just yeah. sort of using these. And but I do now appreciate Emin saying I'm more committed to spontaneity than I am to freedom. Now, especially with that peeping tom example. Or, that's the that's how I remember it, right? Like the, Which one's um, that? He's the creeper, the keyhole. Yeah, the right? keyhole. Oh, we call yeah, him the creeper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. I mean, so yeah, that's all very helpful. And so look I at actually us just, agreeing. I know. Look at us agreeing. Yeah. I, I just because we're so dream. persuasive. Yeah, seriously. But just to sort of return to that question of democracy is just the word that we have now freedom is just the word that we have now in the social and political sense i think it's really useful i just think that there is no better word right now for awakening in awakening in people the kind of possibilities to change the status quo whether in their own individual lives or in the political landscape unless we're using this word freedom and that's I mean, why I, I like I to use I think there are it. other words that are equally useful, but... Like what? Well, y'all are going to make fun of me because it's going to be a techie thing, but non-programmatic is... It, is <laughs> but, like, but does that is have a... Equally? But does that have, like, a kind of social, personal, and political persuasiveness? 100%. No. Yeah, that, 100%. You're not going to get people to, to change politics because you're going to be like, yeah... You're non-programmatic. I'm only going to get people to change politics by saying it's non-programmatic. You're going to say it's because you're It's not already determined. (laughs) Like, I'm I'm only going to get people to vote when I say that it makes a difference. This is not already determined. 
This is a messy process. You cannot write it down. You cannot like this is this is one of the kind of really interesting things like contemporary coders is that there's no perfect voting system. There's no mm-hmm. way to programize a perfect voting system. So anyway, but that's an aside. Well, I, I mean, I like that. I think I was just going back to the Ammon flavored quibbling of words question, which is I like freedom because I think yeah, it I like still freedom. inspires in people a yeah. sense that change on the individual, social, and political level is possible by action and that we don't have to passively submit. There, yeah. Now, I, I'm not sure whether I endorse this or not, but I mean, by the same token, the problem that people have sometimes found with Sartre and de Beauvoir's conception of politics is precisely that if, if freedom is an ontological condition, what's the motivation to have a politics of liberation if we're already free? And if freedom you know, is radical, and I, I get, I'm just throwing this out there, right? But well, I appreciate addition, What's the motivation to have a politics of liberation if we're already free? And if freedom you know, is radical, and I, I get, I'm just throwing this out there, right? But well, I appreciate you throwing this out there, but I don't know if you've noticed that the Beauvoir scholar has not really talked about Beauvoir at all in this conversation. And that's been very intentional. Okay, I'm sorry. So, we can no, keep that if you want. <laughs> no, I, I actually want to save that for a future conversation because okay. I think that there are two different answers to that. And so since we've been talking so much about Sartre, I would say Sartre's answer to that is, I don't really know. I don't really know what to do about that question. There is no real sense of how I ought to act or what I ought to do given these parameters. So I think Beauvoir has a better answer. But Lee, I think, might disagree with me. No, I don't disagree, but I have a question that's going to pivot the conversation. Are we ready to pivot? I think we're ready to pivot. Let's pivot. I think, Shannon, that only human beings are free. I'm going to say, great question, but I can't answer that because I can't think outside of human experience and perception and thought. So I Wait, that is, hold on, hold on. That doesn't make any sense. Even inside of your experience of your consciousness as a free being, do you see that phenomenon exhibited in anything else in reality? I'm really not trying to be evasive. I really don't know how to answer that question because I just, not to to say anything about bats, but I don't know what it's like to be a bat. Yeah, I don't don't know what it's like. Okay, let me, okay, so I'm sorry. I'm going to keep pushing that. Okay, please. I'm, I'm not asking, do you think that there are other beings or phenomena that experience themselves as being free in the way that we experience ourselves as being free? Okay. But do you see in other phenomena something that exhibits the same thing that you call freedom that you experience in your own being? I might if I understood AI better. <laughs> she, she, she says she, carefully. She's trying to beat me to the punchline. <laughs> well, I think you're like, la- you're leading me to the punchline on a gilded path here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before you get there, because I'm, I'm sure that is the punchline. Let, I'm having trouble with your question, Lee. So I want to make sure I'm understanding your question right. I thought we had stipulated that we're not denoting some sort of like objective property by the term freedom here. Yeah, I thought that too. No, no, no. We're, div- we're div- way in which we, or whatever it is that we're claiming is free, experiences our self or itself. I don't know about AI either. So let's say let's say that we found a, a really smart dog. I don't know. And, and I, again, like I don't want to get into animals and freedom too much, right? But but if we wanted to say like, okay, so another conscious being, right, a being which we grant has consciousness, does this being have freedom? It, it seems like you'd be asking the question, how is this being experiencing its world? Yeah. And that's where I think Shannon's point about the bat comes in. Like I've got some guesses about how the dog experiences their world. Does is spontaneity or freedom a part of how the dog experiences its world? Okay. I think spontaneity, but not freedom. But that's a okay. Difference. Like, do they okay, walk so, up to the edge and are like, "Do I do this?" Oh shit. Okay, yeah. but here, here. Okay, so sure. yes, I I stipulate that I cannot know what it is to be a bat or an alien or an AI or a dog for that matter. Where Shannon started was that 
whether it is objectively true or not, really real or not, it is the case that human consciousness experiences itself as being free. Right. Now, now the experience of itself as being free is not the definition of freedom, right? Like right. we have another definition of freedom, which is being able to act in undetermined, non-programmatic ways, etc. And I think it's important to say that as a human consciousness, I experience myself as being free. There are things that I name things that I do in my experience that I name as kind of qualities of a free being. Now, it is obviously important, morally important, politically important to be able to uh, identify other things that are free and are not free. So I want you to vote. I don't want my dog to vote. I don't want my chair to vote. So I don't think like I'm not asking a super complicated question when I say, are there other things in the world that are free? Right. Like I'm not asking. No, there's nothing I'm else not, in the I'm world not, free. It's just I'm not asking. Okay. I'm not ask, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> but, all right. But that's because so, we're not free either. So, <laughs> we experience ourselves as free, but we're not free. So and Lee, so, let me, let me yeah. ask you, I'm getting the sense that you think that there are other things and that we can observe through the, their actions that they have a similar, if not identical, non-programmatic, non-determined arena that we might call freedom, arena of action that we might call freedom. Yeah, so let me put a huge caveat on what I'm about to say, which is that I don't want to say that there are other things in the world that are identical to human beings or that have experiences that are identical to human beings' experiences of human consciousness. However, I do think that if we're not asking that question, then we have all then we have all kinds of moral problems that robust philosophies of freedom ought to put at the forefront for us, which are things like are non-human animals free? Are machine systems free? If an alien shows up, what's it going to have to do to for me to recognize it as free, right? As like me, as, for example, deserving of arguments and persuasion and deliberation and all of those sorts of things. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose to kind of short answer your question, yes, I think that there are other things in the world that I think deserve that consideration, specific things that I can think of. But that's the question that I'm asking you. So I'm not asking you, like, can you get in the mind of other things? And do they also want to drop babies like you? Well, if the question is that we really ought to be thinking. <laughs> she was like, she was like, I'm going to jump right into this. Answer I know, and I'm ignore, just going to ignore wait. that. Ignore that shade. So I'm just happy. These questions at the floor. Yes, exactly. I mean, whether or not we can objectively say anything about the way other types of existences experience the, the world is not really that important because we've already said we can't objectively say that human beings are free in this metaphysical, ontological, maybe physiological, whatever sense. But forcing ourselves to ask the questions about other ways of existing and whether those other ways of existing exhibit or experience freedom in the way that we do is absolutely necessary. And for yeah, all because, the reasons that you like, say, because how else are we going to really be able to talk about ethics applied to non-human animals? It, how are we going to be exactly. able to talk about uh, the developments in technology and machine learning and artificial intelligence and these kinds of things unless we're actually asking these questions beyond the human scope? Yeah. And like, I mean, I don't know what it's like to be Shannon. I don't know what it's like to be right. Ammon, but I take you both to be free. And there <laughs> are all does. these, <laughs> there are all these kinds of, <laughs> there are all these kinds of yeah. moral and political obligations that are attendant to that ascription of freedom to you. And so that's really what I'm asking. So my desire in pivoting this conversation is really just to kind of pivot to the implications of the ascription of freedom or the recognition of freedom or the delineation of the characteristics of free things. That's really what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Okay, when you use the word recognition, that helps me out a lot. So the question is something like, should we recognize other things as free? You mean like okay. in the Hegelian sense? Yeah, or in the okay, sense of, yeah. or in a political sense. Well, that's the Hegelian. Which is a Hegelian. Sense. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. It makes me think that a future conversation that we should have should involve these kinds of questions, especially when we talk more along the lines of developments in technology and philosophy of technology that Lee happens to be pretty 
pretty astute in. I'm down for that. Okay, so here's a question about you, Ben. To name three things in the world that you think we ought to give serious consideration to whether or not they are free. Dogs, I, pigs. No, it can't be three non-human animals. That's one thing. But like, that's no. like, my, like you're asking me to think about things that I obviously don't know. I'm going to say artificial intelligence, even though I don't really know what that means. I'm okay, so non-human animals, non artificial, animals, intel like, artificial intelligence, and what's another one? Aliens? It could be real or imagined. Aliens, is that what you said? Fairies. <laughs> Fairy folk. Okay, maybe not that imagined. <laughs> That's you've already Angels? you've already prejudiced my answer. Yeah. So, okay, so, so Shannon's answers are what? Non humans, AI, and maybe not that imagined. <laughs> That's you've already Angels? you've already prejudiced my answer. Yeah. Angels. So, okay, so, so Shannon's answers are what? Non humans, AI, and 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 I think we can put angels, fairies, and aliens Fairy all in the category of beings that we have not yet encountered. So says you. So <laughs> you've already you've already ruined my answer, Lee, and I'm really sad. I think Lee has definitely like <laughs> given us here's your here's your three things you can choose. Now choose those three things. No, no, she I What else is there? Describing. What else is there than those three so, possibilities? So I think well, with I'm gonna take my microphone and go home. I would say that some non human like pigs and dogs, sure. Whales and elephants, almost definitely. Cockroaches dolphins, dolphins for sure. Cockroaches, no fucking way. Right. Right. And again, like this is not some sort of description of the overall value, but when we're talking about the kind of meaning making that we think about, I think that it is r useful some forms of animals from others because we seem to be able to encounter something like meaning making more readily. But anyway, so I'm I'm with you, Shannon, on seeing them as separate. But okay, so you're gonna say non-human animals that exhibit some kind of advanced intelligence. I'm yeah. using the word intelligence. I know you're not using the word intelligence, but I would go with that. Okay, so non-human animals... Not that, that they shouldn't be considered morally. So we have to still consider the moral relevance and well-being of cockroaches because no. they're part... But we do <laughs> right. because they're part, of, they're part of the world and the shared right. world and it's all interdependent. But as far as discussions of what we would consider to be freedom in the way that we've been talking about it in this conversation, I do not think we have to apply that to cockroaches. And what so, about viruses? No. We don't have to apply that to viruses either. Amen. Viruses? So one of my answers was going to be, and I would need to think about this some more, but certainly a candidate for freedom on the way that you're talking about it, some forms of ecosystems or systems of life. So yeah, I mean, I think that you could argue that the kind of spontaneity that we're talking about, and maybe even, again, I'm not enough of an ecologist, right? But you know, I've read ecologists who talk about complicated systems as producing spontaneous and non-deterministic ways of meanings. So I would say that the kind of freedom we're talking about might be ascribable to natural systems as a whole. Now, hold on. We have gone so far away from what we started with that now we're talking about <laughs> viruses and systems. And I'm not <laughs> saying that these are not valuable, important things that have to be given moral consideration, but that they have the sense of freedom that Sartre is talking about in so far as the bride is worried about soliciting passersby as a prostitute. Nature worries about that all the time. I'm telling you, <laughs> it is very fecund. Yeah. But, but Shannon, have I you mean, read Demeter? On, like, Shannon, you sat down in the hot seat for this episode. Yeah. So that is the question. Like that is the question. Is there a possibility in your concession of freedom to consider non-human beings or systems as free? I think I'm going to say it's a really good question. And I'm like, not just I'm not doing that to dismiss it. I'm doing that to say, I don't know. I don't but, know. I mean, it's totally fair to say, look, if, if we're going to just stay within the city limits of Sartsville, then no. Right. right? Because Sartre's freedom is all the way down human freedom. Yeah. Right. It's absolutely all right, dependent all right, on this yes. structure that is yeah. like facticity and transcendence. And it's yeah. all the way dependent on yeah. that. And that's totally fine to be like, I'm sticking with this notion of freedom. We want to talk about something that is analogous to this phenomenon in other forms of being. 
we're going to need to find another word for it. And freedom is not the word. That's totally fine to say. I think I'm going to say that. And that actually, <laughs> right. But that goes back to when you, wait, what did you say when you said, you know, non-programmatic? And I said, no, you can't use that. That's not in any way a persuasive word. That's not going to drive yeah. anybody politically. And you were like, what are you talking about? Of course it would. And that's maybe, that's where this comes together. Yeah, well, like I, I mean, I was is. I was playing the long game in my question yeah. Here. I see, <laughs> I see that was good. Now I'm so now I I I think that's right. I think that there is a reason then to go back to the quibbling over words. There is maybe a reason to save freedom for something like what we've been talking about as far as the way humans experience themselves in the world, and that would okay. be a need a different term and a different category yeah. for an analogous an equally important term for non-human animals, non-human systems, whatever, okay. whatever. Okay, so correct me if this is not a fair summary, but it sounds to me like what Shannon has been saying all along is that this word freedom is a descriptor of actions of human beings, but also of the self-awareness of human consciousness of itself, Yes. right? And when Ammon, at the, way back a million years ago, said, I'm more committed to spontaneity than I am to freedom, it seems like Ammon is willing to say that this emphasis on spontaneity allows for a non-human consideration of what Shannon calls freedom in human action and human uh, consciousness. Yes. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah, very well done, O Socrates. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah. All right, so we like to end our podcast by asking each other, or rather, I should say, by giving each other one thing that we agree on and one thing that we may disagree with, especially with the person in the hot seat. So since I have taken the honor of being the first one of us to be in the hot seat, then I am going to give you both the opportunity to say something that you agree with in what I've said and perhaps something that you disagree with with what I've said. You've persuaded me that when Sartre is talking about radical freedom, I don't need to worry about that he's trying to covertly sneak in free will, which will uh, ingratiate my students to you forever because I always get a little bit upset about that. And so that'll be nice for them. I still am a little bit of a Foucauldian and Deleuzian on these things, though. I'm still not personally. That'll be nice for them. I still am a little bit of a Foucauldian and Deleuzian on these things, though. I'm still not persuaded that freedom names a cat i'm still persuaded that spontaneity is a better word and that freedom doesn't name a category that is not particularly useful anymore fair enough lee what do you got for me okay so i loved this conversation and i i want to say that shannon i love your all-in commitment to <laughs> the classic post-war french existentialist notions i'm of old freedom. school I think well, but I think it's like still very useful and it is where my heart is and it's, it's where I'm the most easily drawn. And I've always said since I was an undergraduate that the first time I read Being in Nothingness, the chapter on bad faith and being in nothingness was by a, a million miles the most intuitively true thing I have ever read in I have ever read in philosophy. And I'm actually really looking forward to hearing you talk more about Beauvoir, who I don't really love so much as a philosopher. So I'm ready to be persuaded. What I would agree with you about is really the whole of your description of Sartre and freedom. I think that that's exactly right. I think it is a robust and useful philosophical and moral and political notion of freedom that you have gotten exactly right. I think that what I would disagree with is whether or not it is extensible to other things. I mean, how human really is it? And that, as both of my co-hosts already know, has a lot to do with the fact that the edges of the definition of the term the human are, are getting fuzzier by the day for me. So, right. So, I mean, I would also, nobody asked me whether or not I disagreed with Ammon, but I also disagree with Ammon that I don't think spontaneity is the right word there either. I think both of those words could be used 
in our experience in really philosophically useful and interesting ways. So yeah, that's what I would say. I mean, it's a hard degree and a cautionary disagree. Well, I certainly appreciate this conversation because this is something very close to my heart and something that I'm very passionate about. And just as a final plug for my absolute love for this post-war conception of freedom, and I imagine you all have seen it too, it it does change people's lives. Oh, yeah. And not in the self-help sort of easy way, in the really difficult, challenging the assumptions about oneself and the world way. And it happens all the time that people are exposed to these ideas and they choose differently. So I- It 100% I, changed my life. And I know for a too. fact, I, th- like me there's too. no other text that I have more students come back to me later and say, oh my God, <laughs> like this changed yeah. the way I think about things. That's right. I will just say that I was on a very different trajectory before I was exposed to existentialism as a freshman in college than I ended up being after having been exposed to it. So freedom! Hey, we should probably also just go ahead and put out there that our listeners, you can throw in your own agrees and disagrees. Our Twitter is at Hotel Bar Podcast. We have a Facebook page that's Hotel Bar Sessions Podcast. And also you can visit our website at hotelbarpodcast.com. And hey, I'm really super excited about the next episode in which Ammon's going to be in the hot seat. And what are you going to be talking about, Ammon? I'm going to be talking with you guys about art, mm. where there's no freedom. <laughs> where it's pers- all determined. I'll try to keep Lee awake. Can I talk well, about I'm looking the forward to it. Can sure I talk about The Bachelor? Lot, is sure The Bachelor a art? Lot of, lot of- odds. And then Lee's like, oh, fairies and angels aren't real. Well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys. We just got last call at the hotel bar. I'll catch y'all next time. Good to see you. Take it easy. Bye.